Okay guys, back for another Portable Clint. The coolest thing about having your own show is that you get to hang out with Pete Gardner uh, for the next 30 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, Pete Gardner. Hey. Hello. 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 I never know where to look. There? You can look anywhere you want. Well, no, but I look crazy a lot yeah. of times when people do like selfies and stuff like that and I'm always like, mm. Well, it's right there, but a lot of people want to look at the red. Yeah, is that the place? You can look anywhere you want, but I think that's the bottom. But we're like, see the, the lens it's is right there. there. Yeah, 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 it's right there. Pete Gardner, how in the heck are you, friend? I'm super. How are you? Nice Good. to see you. Pete, where in the hell are you from? Uh, I'm originally from a place called Scarsdale, New York, home of the diet and the murder. Because <laughs> uh, there was a diet, Scarsdale diet. Sure. Back in the yeah, day, oh, that's and right. Then, uh, Dr. Tarnauer got killed. So that was the murder part of that little okay. bit that I've been saying probably for 100 years. <laughs> um, anyway, only the classics. All right, so what's uh, what's up? And oh, I've got a question for you. Okay. You got two questions. Okay. One, were you named after Clint Eastwood? Because yes. he was probably yes. famous at that Absolutely. time. Absolutely. 100% my mom and dad went to see Play Misty for me a few nights before I was delivered. Mm -hmm. And they go, Clint, that's a good name. So, yes. Wow. Okay, and then the other half of your name, Culp, are you any relation to Robert Culp? No. Because that's the only Culp I know. My biggest joke, and it wasn't, it's not even a joke, but when I first moved out here, I was probably asked that question 12 times a day. Really? Yeah. And, I and said, how many times did you say yes? Well, I should have said yes, yes because yes, I had a slow a start. I Just know. to see what, yeah. what that's going to do. Because yeah. you said no all these other times, nobody cares. Then they all are like, uh-huh, thanks. <laughs> all right, Pete Gardner, you ready mm -hmm. to do Yes, that? I'm ready. I'm ready. I know we're on the clock. Yes. Okay, Pete Gardner. Yes. You're from Scarsboro, New York? Nice. You, Scarsdale. Whatever. Scarsdale. <laughs> hey, Pete. <laughs> okay. okay, Scarsdale, New York. Uh -huh. I've never heard of it, to be honest. No, I've heard of it, but I've never heard anybody being from there. So congratulations. Thank you very much. I have a little interview coming up in the Scarsdale Inquirer oh. coming up for the very first time in my life. <laughs> so I'm very impressed about that. Actually, I was in the paper when I was a little kid. It's a very small paper. And uh, when they opened the Scarsdale pool, I was on the cover of the paper. Oh, wow. I know. It's kind of a big deal. I'm very impressed. Wow. Okay. Okay. Pete so Gardner. we're starting there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. When did you move out to Los Angeles or when did your Hollywood career adventures start? How about that? My Hollywood adventure career? Yeah. Um, well, I started in Chicago um, back in the 80s. And I what did year? improv what and year? Some, oh, because I guess it would be 87. Okay, because I started in 87. You did? Yeah, so I always like to hear that number for some reason. Yeah, well, it's very comforting. Yeah, You feel like, oh, well, this is where I am, that's where he is, that's where yeah. I am, whatever. Right. Um, but I started in, you know, I went, I was traveling the world. I went, uh, when I was, I got out of college, I was just like, I want to have some adventures. I want to get some character in my life. You know, I want to know what's going on in the world. And I went off to Australia, New Zealand, Thailand, Nepal. And when I got to New Zealand, which was the first stop of my trip, I went to go see a movie called Birdie. Yeah, okay. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. And I haven't seen it since, and I don't even know why it struck me so powerfully when I saw it as a kid. But there were two young actors in it. I think it was Nicolas Cage and, um, oh, the guy that was in um, Stranger Things. Yes, the Sean doctor. Astin. No, no the, uh, uh, Matthew Modine. Matthew Modine. I believe that's who was in it. Sure. And I was so moved when I walked out of that movie that I was just about to start this 11-month tour by myself, just traveling around. And I thought, oh, this is what I got to do. That's what I really got to do. Why am I fucking around doing this? I should really get going on that. And so in the back of my mind, the whole time I was on that trip, I was like, I'm going to get this going. I'm going to move to Chicago. I'm going to get it started. And that's how I'm going to do it. Like I like all of a sudden it clicked into a plan. Yeah. And yeah. I think that that was really important because the whole time that I was on that trip, I was thinking I got to get do it. And, and so that was always kind of ticking. And then when I got home, I went to uh, Martha's Vineyard and made some money, then moved to Chicago, moved to Chicago, and I did Improv Olympic with Del Close. Sure. And Del Close. You worked with Del Close personally? Um, I mean, we didn't meet at his house. I took his classes. Okay, I'm just because I always hear people like him, but never really met him. So you oh no no, I I met him many times. He was a, he was an interesting character. Tell me one neat thing about him. One interesting thing about him, really quick. One interesting thing about him is he always said, and I'm not sure who, who the original quote is, but he was like, "God is in the details." Okay. And be specific. And also the thing that I think of that Dell says all the time is, if you're going to parody something or satire something, you've got to love it. Don't take it on the thin. Don't 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 
don't have the thinnest understanding of what it is, really understand it and own it and love it, and then you can make fun of it, and that is brilliant advice. Yeah, it is. Because otherwise, you're just doing an imitation of an imitation. But if you do, like, if you really love it, you will get all the nuance and the same thing, all the details. So that was the one thing I loved about Dell. Dell was kind of an interesting character. He was kind of scared. Like, one time I talked to him, and I was like, Hey, uh, can you explain something? He was so weirded out by having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. He just was like, anything you could do to maneuver out of that room and not have that talk with me. But then I was in a play with him a couple years later and he was very nice and he was very friendly and we talked about improv and it was really meaningful to me because he really wanted to talk to me rather than me trying to get nice, something Nice, nice. Okay, so I did that, I went to Chicago. Then I was in Chicago and some of my friends started to leave for New York. I think uh, David Koechner sure. uh, decided, uh, he went off to do Saturday Night Live and other people started to leave and go to New York or go to Los Angeles. Dave, uh, another guy, Jeff Rosenthal, who had been my uh, roommate for a long time, he moved to LA and James Grace moved to LA and people started to move away. And uh, I was directing at Second City and I realized I started directing and teaching and stuff like that and I started to realize that that was the end of this road like this is this was the the ceiling that I was gonna go to there there really wasn't I was doing commercials and I was directing and teaching and stuff like that but then I was like this isn't where I want to be this isn't what I want to do I really want to work on TV I want to do work in movies and uh, my wife Susie who's amazing she's like go do it go find out like go for six months and find out and we had just bought a house Okay. We just bought a house together, and so we had this house, and my young son, and I left. I left, and I left in September of 96, and uh, I would move to L.A. And Where did I you move to? I moved to a friend's house, uh, Carlos Jacot, uh, down in Santa Monica, no, not Santa Monica, in Venice, okay. on uh, San Juan Boulevard sure. Avenue, whatever that was. Great little house there. Then a friend... Uh, a, a friend of a friend was moving somewhere. I lived on Electric Avenue for a little while sure. in in Venice, and I had a great time. It had like a little, uh, a little like bat cave door, like that. That went. It was a, this little compound, and her garage opened up, and it basically was like the bat cave. Everything kind of sealed behind me, and you were inside the compound. It was great. I loved it. Nice. Anyway, so then my wife came out. I think. Oh, I guess it was like in December of that year. So I had been there from September to December, basically on my own. And then Susie came out and the kid, and then Dexter came, no, Matthew came out, my older son. And uh, and then, you know, we all moved out here and then we got, a, I saw Pat Finn was living in the Valley and I came to the Valley, like I hadn't been there. I've been basically down in Venice. I came to the Valley and I saw people had nice little houses with backyards. Yeah. And I was like, oh, we could totally raise a kid here. This would be great. And so uh, my wife Susie came out, but it was so awesome that my wife Susie had the forethought and also realized that, you know, maybe I would always hold it against her or not against her specifically, but just against my life. If I was like, I should have done it. I never did it. Yeah. I should have done it. Yeah. But she gave me that freedom awesome. to go off and do it. So that was that. That is wonderful, Pete. It's always good when your wife supports you 100%, oh, dude, because I, mine does. And you know what? One of the things was when she came out here, and she worked for a while out here, but the business is very different here than it is in Chicago. In Chicago, it was great. In Chicago, she worked in casting and as an agent. And if I had friends that I'd be like, oh, you got to see this guy. He's great. He's just coming up. He's in classes right now, but he's great. And then Susie would like bring him into the awesome. casting place or bring him into the whatever. And so when Susie came out here and did it out here and she didn't like it at all, I was like, you know what? You never have to work again. I'll do whatever. I'll wow. do industrials. I'll do commercials. I'll do whatever it takes. But you don't have to do that because you've done so much for me. Wow, that's and awesome. And I really, and I, she deserved that because she had done everything and anything for me. So awesome. And it, it, it worked out great. And of course, like two months later or two years later, whatever it was, a couple months later, she starts her own business and starts having a kid's clothing line and opens a store and whatever. So it's like, you can't, you know, she wasn't going to sit home for long. Anyway. Okay, well, that's a, that's a great story because I love it when the woman backs up the man. Or and the man over. backs up the yeah, woman. I mean, okay, we're, exactly. It's a team. Yeah, it Definitely is a team. A team. It is. If you're lucky enough to get married to somebody that's your friend, um, it really is worthwhile. It's worth, I mean, if you're in the you know market for marrying somebody, yeah. make sure you marry your friend. Uh, amen, brother. Okay, what's your first gig that you book out here? First gig was Arliss. What year? Uh, probably a couple months in. 
Uh, so that's probably 96, 97? Six, probably sometime in early 96, maybe like November or something of 96. That was the thing that was good because also uh, I had a house, I had jobs, I had things to go back to in Chicago. And so if it didn't work out, I was going to go back to Chicago. Nice. It would have been hard because it would have been like a ghost town. Okay, sorry about that. The first time, well, the second time that's ever happened. Anyway. Who did it happen to before? Uh, the very first time I did it, I, because I didn't know what I was doing, I forgot to set the airplane mode, uh -huh. which I thought I did on this one. Right, but who was the guest? Uh, the very first guy, Sandro. Sandro, so Sandro and I had that in common. Yes. So back up a little bit, 96 Arliss. Oh yeah, so anyway, so I go, um, I go to Arliss, I do this audition, it was one of those auditions, and uh, I just remember hating it. I remember thinking like I totally failed. And I, I remember coming out and I had a tie on at a certain time. Cause then that was back in the days when I used to dress up for my, uh, cause you know, in commercial auditions, you know, people would dress similar to what the character was thinking that was going to be what's going to put them over the edge. And uh, <laughs> which is ridiculous, <laughs> which, but the best thing was one time I had an audition for King of Queens and I got dressed, <laughs> I wore a brown shirt and brown pants cause I was supposed to be a UPS guy. And I went in there and I did, it was minor. It wasn't like I had like a, a hat and a whatever. I just had brown and brown. And after I was done the audition, the casting director goes, great job, Pete. Oh, and thanks for dressing up. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. But anyway, so I did that. I was tearing up my tie for our lesson. I was just like, oh God, that was terrible. I suck, I suck. And then like 10 minutes later, my agent calls, he's like, well, you booked it. They called us right away and we're like, oh yeah, we definitely won't be. Oh wow, like, man. Are you kidding? And it was very, it was very great. It was very surreal. I don't really remember what happened or I, I think it was fine when we did it or whatever, but I just remember like that, that feeling of that. And then that was a good lesson to learn is that you don't know. You, you don't. don't know what they want, what they like, what, how's it going. So don't ever, so that from then on, I, I stopped. I usually, I'm not one of those guys that redoes it in the car. Right. And you see the oh, guys like in the do parking. That? I oh, don't. Okay. That's not my thing. Wow. I just, I, I drop it. And also, people can be like, hey, I saw you at that thing last week. Uh, what, for what was it? I'm like, no idea. I just basically, it goes into cold storage after I've done it. Hey, that's great. Done. That's a great trait to have. You know man. what, though? It really is, I don't know, it's not, nothing I learned or planned. It just something that I did kind of naturally, just kind of forgot about it. And not until I started to care more <laughs> that I started to feel the, the, the rejection. I never felt the rejection for like all the years that I did it, all in Chicago and the early years and here in Los Angeles. I never felt the rejection ever because I just didn't care. I didn't think about it. Wow, I don't know, it didn't man. hit me. But then like when it started to matter and I was like, I got a mortgage payment to pay or you know, whatever, something to do. Then all of a sudden it became, and then I sort of like, why don't they want me? What's the problem? What am I doing? But it's so funny. It's like, I didn't feel that for years. So I'm, I try to get back to that and yeah. not because it's useless. It's just, it's no, you're absolutely makes it right. terrible and there's no reason to feel it. But that's a great trait that you have and a rare trait because a lot of people that I know, we go home thinking about every little thing we did. Like, oh man, why didn't I do that? Why didn't I do this? Uh, so wasted, you. wasted energy. Pete, I'm going to steal that from you. Oh, for sure. Feel free because it's, uh, it's so freeing because there's nothing you can do after the fact. I mean, the thing is you can come up with all those things before right. and be like, you know, it'd be fun. Be and then the other thing is, I really feel this is true, is that you can come up with all kinds of great stuff you're gonna do in the room when you get there, but when you walk through that door, they're gone. Don't even think about them. And if they come up, they come up. But don't do stuff that you planned at home. Do what's happening in the room. Yeah, Because that's it's true, super man. critical. Because that's where the magic is. That's what people are, that's what I finally realized, is that's what people are paying you the big dollars for, is what's happening right here. It's what's happening between us and is there magic. And if there's magic, that's worth every penny they paid you. And if it's just me doing what I did and you coming up with what you did at home and then us showing up and us being like, hmm, not really connected. Yeah, yeah. Then they lost, they're losing money on that deal. You're absolutely right, Pete. Wow. I really, I mean, that's just my two cents. No, I love those two cents. That's a good, that's powerful. So power you, book Arliss, you, you book Arliss. You book Arliss. Book our list. And that then was I'm a on good one. Way. That was a good one, by the way. I, I love, show. yeah. It was okay. A great show. What happens after you book our list? Is it just booking? Just booking, book, book, book. No. Um, then 
I booked some other. I mean, I'd have to look at my resume. But, well, yeah, just but, but the thing is, with then I started to go. Um, I started to lean into commercials because you know we had to, you know, we had to uh, rent a house. Sure. You know, I wasn't just crashing on people's apartments or you know doing whatever. I had, I had to come up with some major dough. So uh, commercials had always been my money maker. Yeah. And I just started to lean into that a lot harder. Started to book a bunch of stuff, and. Uh, you know, those were great, and I did a lot of great stuff, but, uh, you know, I it was always a little embarrassing. I mean, like, I, there was, I must have done so many jobs. I was a scarecrow, I was the stovetop turkey. I was always in these, like, in these get-ups. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and yeah. it became my thing. And, like, not by choice, but by just, that's the way it worked out. And I remember thinking, if there was anything embarrassing in the audition, I'd be like, guys, this is mine. You know, you like, you, the, you guys gonna be in a towel doing arm farts? That's mine. <laughs> you don't have to worry about it. And then, of course, it always was embarrassing, you know? Like, people would be like, ah, who cares? You know, you're working, that's great. And I'd be like, I went to a friend's wedding, and uh, this guy was like, uh, so I'm watching TV, and I'm seeing like, oh my God, look at that guy in the turkey costume. What an idiot. And then I was like, and then I realized, that was you! <laughs> and I was like, hmm. But, uh, you know, you do what you gotta do. And the thing was, when in my early years, I always felt it like it was a job. And it was just like, I got to do a good job doing this thing. And then as I got older and I, I had done a bunch of them and I started to care less and less, I realized it was like, and somebody said this to me, they were like, oh, I love doing commercials because it's like, I'm also I've realized that I'm very suggestible. Like if you could say something to me and if I think of it that way from now on, all of a sudden it's like, that's the way I feel about it. But somebody said to me one time, they were like, you know, when I do a commercial, I feel like it's my, my movie. It's all about me and whatever. And I was just like, okay, all right, I'll take it that way. And I started to enjoy it so much more because I was like, yeah, that's kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Pete, yes. you, know, you know what one of the funniest things you ever said to me was? What was that? You and I were having an audition for Scrubs. Remember auditioning for Scrubs? Mm -hmm. It was in the Valley. Sure. You had just, I think, chose wearing your mustache. Mm -hmm. it was oh, like that's at true. the very first days of your mustache. Yes. You came up to me and you go, Clint, what can I do to get you into a mustache today? <laughs> Did I really? Yeah, it was, it was so <laughs> oh, funny. there's so many things that I, I say that I'm just like, it. wow. And it, because it was just so rare to hear somebody say, what can I do to get you into a mustache today? <laughs> I thought that was really funny, man. How random. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, funny, the mustache was a total double-edged sword. It, it's, and I wouldn't recommend it to anybody unless it's really your thing. Because well, tell me about tell me what the, the moment that it happened. Well, I was working on I did a little short movie for a friend of mine, Lindsay Stoddard, and uh, she did a thing about a group. Oh, uh, I guess I had done it once or twice, but I did it once before. I did a movie called um, uh, Love Shack, which okay. is all about the porn industry. Sure. And I wasn't thinking a porn stash. I really wasn't. Everybody called it a porn stash, but I was just thinking like, oh, here's an opportunity. It's going to be an improvised movie. I can wear my mustache because my dad had a mustache. My brother had a mustache. My cousin Mike had a mustache. My grandfather had a mustache. Mustaches were big in the family. Yeah. So I always felt like I wanted to do that and I never could because I was doing a lot of commercial stuff and it was verboten, right? Yeah. But. It really was something that I wanted to do. I mean, I've kept it for like 10 years. Yeah, now. yeah. And so anyway, so I did that movie, the first movie with it, and I loved it. Because it, for, honestly, the way it worked for me, it did half of the work for me. People would see me and they'd be like, oh, look at this idiot. And then sort of like, okay, I'm halfway there. <laughs> then I just had to say the words. Yeah. You know, it was like, and it really became a great thing. But now it's not for everybody. It's not gonna work the same way for everybody. Because if it doesn't, if you if you're wearing it for them, it's never going to work. If you're right. wearing it for you, it's going to be gold. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so I did it for a while, and then I was like, so I did it like once or twice, and I loved it. And also, I loved who I was with it. It kind of gave me a character right off the bat. Otherwise, I'm like the whitest guy you've ever met. I just like just white guy. And so I, I, so I did it, and then I asked my family, and I said, I asked my wife Susie, and I was like, I want your advice. What do you think about the mustache? And she's like, lose it. And I asked my older son, who was probably 16 at the time, and I was like, what do you think, mustache? And he's like, ugh, get rid of it. 
And I asked my five-year-old or six-year-old son at the time, and I was like, what do you think? What do you think about the mustache? He goes, you know, Dad, I think there might be more acting opportunities. Wow, at, smart at five kid, or six man. years wow, old. Wow. And I was like, that's the answer I'm going with, which was the answer I wanted to yeah, hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I went with that, and Dexter was right. I worked more as, as soon as I had the mustache. I started, and I. some people would be like, oh, well, yeah, because that's the way you look or whatever. But it was also the way I felt. I felt like I was really being me. I felt like like I was I like I didn't give a damn anymore, and I was just having fun, and it just made everything I did a lot more fun, and that's the way I still feel. And I might t I might get rid of it now because now I've done a character for four years where I had the mustache, and I feel like you know people will associate me with that guy. But I'm not going to be precious about it. I like it. I like having it. Yeah, dude, it looks good damn on you. Cool, right? Yeah, you do look cool. And I, also, you know what gave me the idea was Will Ferrell before he did Anchorman. He was shooting Anchorman, and he was doing like the Kids' Choice Awards or something like that, or some Nickelodeon thing. And I saw him come out, and he had a pair of sunglasses on, and he had a stash, and I was like, oh, he looks cool. Not like he looks ridiculous, and he's, you know, uh, uh, whatever his name was on uh, Anchorman. What was his name? Rick, uh, I cannot believe I cannot think of his name. I know, but anyway, but anyway, it wasn't that. I mean, I can see why people think that now, but that wasn't it. He looked slick. Yeah. He looked slick. And also, it's a for me, my mustache is a 70s mustache. It's just like, it's just part of the thing. It's not porn guy. It's not cop. It's whatever. Right. It's 70s guy. Somebody said this once to me, 70s tennis instructor. <laughs> yeah, man, That's that is. It. That's that it. Is, That's exactly Pete. it. I think uh, oh, I know who did it. I can't. I can't remember exactly, but we said it by right. Ron Burgundy. Yeah, Ron Burgundy. <laughs> right. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, that's the long and short of that thing. And uh, but it, it has been. Uh, but it is a double-edged sword because sometimes people you'll be auditioning for something that you really care about, and people will be like too charactery. Like that's I, you're not. I don't think you're real. But that's why I try to keep it trimmed and not let it get long on the sides and stuff like that because I don't want it to be character. I just want it to be a part of who I am. Okay, Pete, I could go over you. You've done a lot of commercials and mm -hmm. you've done a lot of TV. Right. I could go through all of that, but we would be here all day. If oh, we days and days. Because I just talked about the very beginning and right. it took exactly. me half an hour. So here's the deal: in the middle of your career, on the on the uh, on the, a side closer to the right side of your career. I the saw right you. Side? I'm just trying to say. Oh, as I'm getting the, older. Yes. Oh, oh yeah, sure. Sure. Whatever that is. I remember seeing because I've seen you at auditions for the for last years. for years for years. But there was this one time where I started noticing you differently at auditions. I don't think you were not that you were a big guy who clowns around at, inside of the waiting room, but I saw you taking things more serious. Yep. I don't know what it was, and then I kept noticing, I'm like, man, something is different with Pete. He's taking this acting thing to to another level, and I gotta ask him. So the next time I saw you, we were both auditioning for the Coen Brothers film, Hell Caesar, what was it? Hell Caesar. Hell Caesar. And you and I had a long conversation in the waiting room, and mm -hmm. I, you started an acting, but what was it, what was it that made you take acting to a different level before you book something well, big? a couple of different things. Uh, one, I kind of got to like my mid thirties and I started to realize I just wasn't really all that happy. And I started to realize I, I, I had to go pick up, I had a commercial audition and I picked up my son and I brought him down to remember like West side casting yes, or whatever yes, down there. Yes, on Bundy. And I went down on Bundy and I went down there and it was for a callback for some Polaroid commercial, which is a big deal. Yeah, big deal. Oh my big, God, big. it was so important. And so I brought Matthew home from, I uh, brought Matthew with me to the audition from school. And uh, I ran there and they're like, Pete, Pete, yeah, you're, we're, we're, you're supposed to be here at 3.30, so get right in there. And they were like, so, here we go, we're gonna be ready for you in two minutes, so get ready. And so uh, it was like for the party guy for some Polaroid commercial, and he he's running around in his boxer shorts, because you know nothing says party like boxer shorts. And so I took my pants off, and I was getting ready, and I was doing my hair up like that and whatever, and my son looked at me and he goes, what are you doing? And I thought to myself, it's like, what am I doing? Like, where, what have I, like, what have I got myself into? Like that I've gotten to the point where I was just like, I will do anything, anything you want. And just put me in a commercial. And I was like, wow. It's like, I've become so desperate. And then I just started to think about it. And I was like, what the hell?
wow, this is just such a waste of time. And I was like, I could be doing something with my life that's valuable, like something that helps people, that, that gives back. And I was just like, all I'm doing is pretending and at a very low level. And I was just like, this is, this is stupid. And also I kind of had started to get caught up in like where I was and compared to other people. And then I was also very caught up in how much money I was making. And then I was very caught up in, you know, being a guest star or, you know, uh, top of show and all the status that went along with it. But I totally let the love of the work go away. I just had just given up on it. I was very much, um, I thought improvisation was my art form and I thought acting was my job. And so I remember one day I was at home and um, I was concerned about, I think, taxes or some bill was coming up and it was, a, it was major. And I was really bummed about it. And I happened to be walking from the kitchen through the living room to go into my office. And my son was watching uh, Liar Liar with Jim Carrey. Yeah. And uh, I was all concerned and I was walking through and I stopped and he was laughing at something Jim Carrey was doing. And I stopped for a minute. And I'm no huge Jim Carrey fan, but I stopped to watch for a second and I started laughing and I started laughing and five minutes later I totally forgot whatever my problems were, whatever my concerns were and I was just like, oh my God, this is brilliant. And then I thought to myself, I was like, oh my God, this is a noble pursuit. This is something worthwhile. This is a huge gift to other people. Yeah. It is helpful to other people and I was like, I have got to do this at my very best level that I could possibly do it. And so then I, I really started to think. You know, did you, what, what year was that? Do you remember? No, I have no idea. Okay, probably I'm sorry to some. No, 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 no. Uh, probably sometime in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. Probably, well, probably the early 2000s. I don't know, whenever Liar Liar came out. Okay. Probably a year or two after okay. that. So okay. maybe it was even later. And uh, so I decided I was just like. Wow, I really, um, I, I think the other thing was, <clears throat> is that after a while you start to blame everybody else for your situation. Yeah. You're like, oh, I don't have the best agent, or I don't have the best this, or I don't have, oh, why didn't they see me for that, or whatever, I could be that, or whatever. And I started to realize, no, it's on you. It's on you. You gotta show up. And that's what, it, it took me a long time to really go full circle on that, but, so I went to go see a friend in a play, and the play, I didn't really care for the play at all, but I noticed all the actors were really good. I was like, everybody was great. That play was boring as hell, but that all the people are good. And so I was like, what's the common denominator? So I asked my friend, and he was like, well, everybody here is from the studio. It's from this, this uh, Stuart Rogers studio. And I was like, huh. And I was like, wow, maybe that's something I need to investigate. Maybe that's something I need to do. Long story short, I started taking classes with Stuart, and you know what? It's not so much what Stuart taught me. It, as I mean, he did teach me a lot and I did learn a lot, but what really helped was doing it repetitively over and over, like doing scenes, coming up and doing more stuff and doing more stuff and constantly being busy and constantly working on it. And I did it for so long that I finally made the, the realization that being funny was kind of like a shield from people making fun of me. Right. I was going to make fun of me before anybody else was. Right, right, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yep. And so I started to realize that, I mean, this is so embarrassing, I don't know, whatever, but this might be helpful to somebody. I started to realize, it's like, I'm not comfortable really with emotion. Like, with my emotions, I'm not going to share them with you. My dad died when I was like 13, and I think that might have had something to do with that. That really hurt me, and I really felt like I never wanted to feel that again. Sure. I never wanted to yeah. feel that pain again, so maybe I avoided a lot of that pain. Whatever, also we're in therapy. Anyway, but the truth is that once I realized that, and then I started to open up that my emotional life, and I started to share that, and I was like, God damn it, this is really what it's about. It's like, if you're not sharing, I mean, it's the same thing in any art form, whether you're a writer, whether, because when, uh, when you're reading somebody's writing, they're really sharing their intimate thoughts with you. Yeah, yeah. They're like whispering in your ear exactly how they feel and how they see the world. And, uh, and that's the same thing with an artist, a, a, a painter, a sculptor, anything. You have to share yourself. And I started to be like, I can't believe I, this is just dawning on me. But you know, sometimes it happens. I was probably like, I'm probably like 40 or something like that. 
And I started to, re I started to see that that's what it was. And then I really started to work more because I, I wasn't acting it and faking it. I was feeling it and wow. letting it happen to me. And that's why they pay you the money. Okay, They pay awesome. you the money because of the connection, but they also pay you the money you gotta show. When people say you gotta show up, yeah, that's what they're talking about. You not just show up on the right time. Yeah, You gotta show up with you. And, and the other thing that I realized is you are your own gold. I'm never gonna be John Belushi or Bill Murray or Brad Pitt or whoever I or Tom Hanks or whoever I think is an amazing actor. I'm never gonna be them. That person already exists. Yeah. But nobody is ever gonna do Pete Gardner. That's just that is your goal. And as soon as you can start to realize like who you are and what you have to share, you're gonna be all set. You're gonna be all set, but you can't you're not gonna get everything. And it's you're not supposed to get everything, but um, you just got to show up and when you have an audition it's not somebody else said this I think it was uh, the guy from Malcolm in the Middle and um, what's his name uh, Brian Cranston Brian Cranston said this he's like you're there to show them your take on it and what you think and this is the way you do it and you're there to see if you'd work with them I mean of course you want the money and of course you want the job but you're there because if some people are not your people, there's some people that will be like, no, 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 that's not the way we want it. That we want it done this way, and the people that are like, you know, feel free, loosen it up, because I always want to improvise a little bit, not just like, no, I'll add a word or a button or a joke or whatever, and I don't have to do that on yeah. the day yeah. when we're shooting. I can do it word perfect over and over again, and that's the way we did it on Crazy Ex Girlfriend. You know, we do two t two takes of just the way they wanted it, and then they'd let me play a little bit or whatever, and sometimes what I would do is, I, in the rehearsal, I would do my bit in the rehearsal, and if the crew would laugh, they'd be like, and then I would do it straight, and they'd be like, how oh, come we're not doing the thing? And I was like, oh, if you want me to. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but that's what, so, and, and that really, I gotta say that that brings me such joy to get that opportunity yeah. to do that, because it's written, and it's very, it, I, I don't think, it's not about me, It's it's me, collaborating with them and adding a little button it's very easy when it's all laid out in front of you to add a little spice on the end yeah so I don't think that it's extra special what I'm doing it's just me being me and me sharing yep, a little bit yep. more of me but I can do it you know letter perfect I don't have that I don't have a problem with that but I, it gives me such joy when they do let me do it it's a really it, that's a gift Okay, Pete. Yes. We're going to... Did we cover it? We covered it. Okay. But now we're going to start winding down. Okay, winding But we're going to start winding down by starting to talk about a week a week before you have an audition for a crazy ex-girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Tell me what that week was like. Was Were you busy in Hollywood? Were things going great in Hollywood for you before you got this audition for crazy ex-girlfriend? They were good. Yeah, they were good. Um... They weren't amazing. I mean, they were good, but you know, as you get older, it starts to whittle down. Uh, you don't. It, it's not like you're out every day like right. I used to be. But the thing is, you end up getting more of the things that you're going out for because you're in a smaller, kind of a smaller uh, school of people that are going out for those things. And so I actually, and then the thing is, you, you have to embrace that. Yeah. You can't, the most important thing is stop freaking out. And then the great thing is my wife, Susie, once again, there's so many times I've been like, oh my God, when I turned 50, I, I'm never gonna work anymore. And I, the, the auditions are so much lower than they used to be. Ah, blah, blah, blah. And Susie'd be like, you always work. Shut up, just relax, keep busy, work on your stuff. And then when it's time, awesome. it'll be time. Yeah. So so I, don't, I try not to panic because I feel like panic shows up in the room. Yeah. Oh my God, oh, when yeah. you show up hey, in the room man, the, yes. and, and they get it, they smell it. Yes. They're just like, oh my God, he needs this so bad. Yes. And you know what, it, you can't do that. And unfortunately, and then the other thing happens where you show up and you're like super loosey goosey and maybe you should have been a little tighter with it. So it's like, you are always kind of, it's always a pendulum. Like so there's times where it's like, and then there's times where you just work on it as much as you can and then you let it go. So you, that's the best of both worlds. Right. You do the work, but then you let it go. So I did, so wait, we didn't answer your week-long question. Well, no, or? So, but that was pretty much it. I just wanted to know, and then the day you get an audition for Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, did you look at the audition? Did you think something well, special I had about audition, this? I had an audition for Crazy Ex-Girlfriend the year before. Okay, and just I, for what? For what did you audition same for? Same character. Same character, and I was working on a show called The Brink, 
okay. with uh, Jack Black yeah. yes. and Tim Robbins, and it was a great show, and it was HBO, and I was very excited to be a part of it. Actually, I got a job to audition I for... loved the brink, by the way. I'm just realizing what that was. Yes. Oh, it was great. It was great. It was great. It was great. But here's the thing. I went with my family. This is what happens to actors all the time. You go on vacation... And then I went on vacation to Idaho with my wife. Sure, I already and know I get where to this Idaho, is going. Yep. Yeah. And they call me, but it's not even for a gig. They call me for the table read at the brink. And I was like, oh, I, was like, I don't know. And I was like, I don't know if that's worth it. My wife, of course, like, go. You should definitely go. Just get a flight back, go home. And I was like, oh, but really, I'm on vacation. And anyway, I did. I went home, but it was at HBO. Everybody in the cast was there, so it was Tim Robbins and all those guys. I was playing like two or three different characters, and instead of just doing the, you know, I'm just gonna read it and whatever, low profile, I went for broke. Nice. I went for broke, and everybody was laughing, and it was the greatest feeling in the world. I, I'm sure you've had that experience, yeah, yeah, yeah. where like you're making people laugh yes. that you have great admiration for. And then uh, that was a great thing. And then a couple weeks later, they gave me a, uh, well, I had to audition, but they gave me a, a play to an FBI agent where I came back for a couple episodes. Right. And it was really great. But I was working on the brink. Uh, a couple of days later, I had had an audition for Crazy Ex-Girlfriend to play Daryl. And I loved it. And I was having so much fun. I sang two songs. I, that was the only time I sang a song for the audition. I sang Brahms Lullaby because I had done in German. I sang Brahms Lullaby in German because wow. I did the mustache guru or the beard guru. Uh, was a commercial that I had done with James Harden. Sure. And because, you know, he's very famous yeah, for yeah, his beard. Yeah. And so I had done that and they wanted me to learn that for the commercial. So I had it in my head. So I was like, I'll do that. And then the other thing I sang was, uh, I love my baby, my baby loves me, which uh, Jeff Daniels sang in the Purple Rose of Cairo. So totally rando songs. And, uh, and I auditioned and I had fun and I just loved it. But then they were like, we'd like Pete to come back for, you know, we're gonna go further. We want Pete to go further. And uh, I was working on the brink and they wouldn't release me. Wow, and I wow, started wow. at like 7 in the morning where I had something and then at 7 at night and at 2.30 was going to be the audition and they wouldn't release me. And I was like, no, you're kidding me. Please, come on, just let me sneak out for a little bit. And they're like, Pete, if the chance that you don't come back, yeah, you're going to be screwed. Yeah. I can't do it. And so I let it go. I let it go and somebody else got it and uh, they did it for Showtime. They did the shot the pilot for Showtime. A year later, Showtime passed on the pilot and the CW said, oh, we'll take it, but we wanted to expand it to an hour. And then uh, I had a job where I was going to do shoot something in Israel. Uh, for It was Angela Kinsey and a couple other great people, uh, Jillian Bell. Uh, we were going over to Israel. And so I was pretty excited about that. I was going to go to Israel for like two weeks. And it was go all going to be improvised. And I was like, oh, this is going to be great. And then Crazy Eats Girlfriend calls again. And they're like, we're gonna replace the guy that played Daryl. We'd like you to come in. And I was like, okay, but to be honest, I'm going to New Hampshire and then from New Hampshire, I'm dropping off my son and then I'm gonna go off to, you know, whatever. And so I think they were like, well, put yourself on tape. And I put myself on tape and I looked at the sides and I was just like, and I had my son Dexter put me on tape and I was just like, okay, let's just do it. And I did it and I improvised a little bit and I had some fun and they're like, oh, we definitely want Pete to come back. And I was like, well, I'm going to Israel and I'm not gonna be able to come back for whatever. And I was like, and I'm supposed to leave for New Hampshire tomorrow or whatever. And they're like, they paid for my ticket to go to New Hampshire. So I was like, oh, so they're kind of interested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I was like, cause they're putting out a couple of dollars for that. And so I was like, okay. And then I went in and I auditioned with Rachel Bloom. And, and it was like, I was thinking like it was going to be like a director's thing, you know, like where like it's in a big room and there's lights and a big camera. Yeah. It was like on a camcorder. It was like a commercial audition. It was like a camcorder and some of the lights weren't really working in the room that we were in. And I was like, well, this is kind of janky. And uh, I did it with them. And then I think I messed up a word. I think I messed up a word. I said Glendora or instead of Glen Ellen or I said Glen Ellen instead of Glendora, whatever. And I was like, oh, let's go again because I, I messed the word up. And Rachel Bloom was like, don't worry about it. She's like, do whatever you want. And as soon as she said that, I was just like, really? And I was like, <laughs> okay. And I grew up, and there were, there were some jokes in the, in the scene about um, me not being very um, understanding of, uh, you know, saying things that are very off color about uh, the Jewish people. And I grew up in Scarsdale, New York, where the percentage of Jewish people were 80% to like, 
20%, whatever it was. I don't know what the exact amount. But so I went to so many bar mitzvahs. I knew so many, all my friends are Jewish. Sure. I knew everything about it. So I had bits galore in my back pocket of like, you know, just everything. And so then Rachel and I, Rachel said, well, let's improvise a little bit. And then we improvised a little bit and I did all those bits and I could see, and I always tell people this, but I looked in her eyes when we were doing it and you could tell she was just like, go for it. Just nice, go nice. It. You, could, you can really yeah, see yeah, in no, somebody's know, eyes. Yep. Because you can also see in somebody's eyes, they're like, what the hell are you doing? Yep, yep. Because I get that, you see casting directors yeah. do that all the time, but yep. they're like, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> and I, that's like the worst feeling in the world because yeah. then you're like, what? And that you could even, it could even be like, you know, something has nothing to do about you. But anyway, so, um, so anyway, so I did that and that was it. I did it and I saw somebody else coming in after me and I was like, oh, maybe they'll get it, whatever. And then I went off to Israel and they were like, well, you're going to network. And I was like, oh, wow. I was like, they're going to just send my tape. And they're like, yeah. And then, so then they, they were sending that tape that tape if you were studio. in town, If you were in town, would you have had to go in and do it again? Oh, yeah. Okay, wow, this is working out in your I favor. I know. Wow. I know, that's always the, that's the kicker that people don't realize. It's like, oh, it, the more it starts to mean, you know, the more it has value. Yes. Oh, yep, yep. Yep. Wow, man. And so, and so it was the biggest gift in the world. I really, I mean, it really felt like, I mean, yeah. the universe was giving, cut me some slack. Sure. And, uh, so I was in Israel, and of course there's a major time dis difference in Israel, so the audition, uh, I think it was like, uh, so I got past studio. Okay. And so once I got past studio, I was like- Your tape got past studio. My tape got past studio, so then I was like, well then this tape's good. Like, that it's funny, that people like it, because they wouldn't, you know, they'd be like, oh, he's funny, but we'll pass. Anyway, so then I went to the next thing, and I was waiting, uh, I was waiting to hear, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna unplug my phone, I'm gonna unplug my computer because I just don't wanna hear it. I don't wanna hear, they love you. You came in second, but yeah. it just didn't It didn't fall your way. This other guy's got more credits, this other guy's from someone else, and I just didn't wanna hear it. And then like three o'clock in the morning, I just had to know, and I started plugging all my stuff in, and everything lit up like a Christmas oh, tree, man. and everybody oh, was man. calling me, and they're like, you booked it, you booked oh, it, you booked man. it. And, I, and also the thing was, it wasn't a pilot. Yeah, but It was it, sold to series. Yeah. So I knew I was gonna work for a season on this show, and it was my dream I'd always wanted, and I was, I, I, as you can tell right now, I got so emotional, because I was like, God damn it. I've waited so long. I've worked on so many different things, and fine. But you know what I always said was, it's just a matter of the cogs lining up. Yeah. Because you gotta do it for a few years if yeah. you're not gonna do it. It's gotta fit like a glove. Yeah. It can't be like, yeah, he's pretty good at it, or he's funny at that accent, or whatever. It's gotta fit like a glove, and it really did fit like a glove. And I was prepared for what I had to do, and all the emotional stuff that I had to do on that show. Because it was very funny, but, you know, it's like initially I thought I was just the goofy boss. Yeah. And then when I got the job, they I, they had a you know they had me into the writers room to meet the writers, and they were like, uh, oh, so your first song, which is the only thing I was really concerned about, because I'm not a singer, I'm not a singer at all. That I pull this off is a joke. It's like it's crazy. I'm just an improviser. I'm not a singer, and I still know that. And I just got back from Radio City Music Hall where I sang in front of 6,000 people. That's crazy. The first time I had sang in public was two years ago in front of 200 people at Largo, and I was like, I can't believe I just did that. And to sing at Radio City Music Hall, I mean, I don't think, I'm not kidding myself, I don't think that I'm any better than I was two years ago. But I did it, I pulled it off, and I had a total joyous experience doing it, but it was crazy. It was Dude, totally that's great. Awesome, man. I was, I mean, I, that, and then my sons joined me on stage. Rachel Bloom had them on stage for. Uh, it was a, it was a joyous. I mean, what a way to end a series. Usually, series just disappear, yeah. and you're like, oh yeah, what happened to that? But that we got to do four years. We get to do four seasons, and then do. We went on a tour, and we toured, you know, Chicago, Portland, all these places, and then uh, that we got to do it at Radio City Music Hall was a dream. I mean, it was one of those things where real life went beyond what my dreams ever were, wow, that I would ever wow, get to wow. do that, would ever get to sing. And also, there is no greater joy than somebody giving you a funny song to sing. I mean, you know, as being yeah, a funny yeah. guy, 
but to get that, that is such a gift. Yeah. Because that is just like, that's just, and then they let me do it. And the one thing I'll say just about that, just about doing that on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, was that the week before I had to do my song was Santino Fontana. Santino Fontana is now the lead of Tootsie on Broadway to rave reviews, he sings like Sinatra, just beautiful. I had to go after him, I had to follow him. <laughs> and we would oh, sing the songs live on the ta oh, at the table wow, read. Wow. And I was just like, ah! and I thought that they were like, you know, they were gonna give me time to practice with the song so that I could kind of get up to speed. And they didn't, because the song was, I love my daughter, but not in a creepy way. And CBS wouldn't sign off on it because they thought it was too risky. Yeah. And so I didn't get the song until Sunday night. The table read was Wednesday. I had been panicking about it since, you know, a month before. So I was like, oh God, this I just like choke, choke, choke. And then I went to, it turns out the guy who lived, um, the guy who helped uh, David Hyde Pierce before he went to Broadway to do uh, Spamalot. Okay, he yeah. Never, he was never a singer either. And so, but the guy that helped him lived across the street from me. Wow. Just by coincidence. Wow. So I went across to him and I was like, on Monday, I was like, you got to help me out. Like, what can you do? What can you do to help me out? And he's like, well, just sing the song and we'll see what happens. So we sang the song a couple of times and he was like, and this is what made all the difference. Once again, I'm very suggestible. He was like, you're great. He's like, you're going to be great. It's going to be fine. You're going to be fine. He's like, you sound fine. He's like, uh, you could think about doing this. It might be funny if you did that. And I was like, okay, yeah, okay, I'm fine. So once again, I was easily suggestible. Wow, wow. <laughs> and Neil Flynn did that to me initially when I met with Neil Flynn for breakfast and I was like, hey Neil, I, I'm doing this show and I gotta do some press for it. I've never worked on the show and I don't know anybody. I was like, what, what can I expect? And he was like, just, you know, when you're doing press, you just tell the truth. If you can, be a little funny, but keep it short and simple. And, but just make it simple, don't, don't get into too much. And I was like, great, that's great advice. He's like, what's the show that you're doing? And I was like, I'm doing this uh, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend and, and it's a musical. And Neil Flynn, Neil Flynn, who's like a guy's guy? He's the know? father in uh, the middle. He's father in the middle. He was the janitor on Scrubs. Yep. And uh, he said to me, he was, he's so funny. He was all of a sudden, he was like, oh, you're never going to get that opportunity again in your life. He's like, just enjoy it. And I was like, oh, I'm never gonna get the opportunity in my life. Oh, I'll just enjoy it. Wow. And I just told wow. him, and then I, because of course my brother was like, you gotta sing in front of all these people that are gonna be watching you on TV. Of course his brothers do. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. I was like, Whoa. But anyway, uh, so when I ended up doing the, when I ended up doing the table read and I had to sing the song, the, the thing that always served me well was I just went for broke. Never, and that was the same thing like that uh, that that um, table read. I just went for broke. Just don't leave anything on the shelf. Don't leave anything of like what I could do or should I take a chance or should I try it. Same thing happened to me when I was at uh, Radio City. I had some joke because before me at Radio City was Lynn Manuel Miranda. Wow, he came on <laughs> as the guest, and I had to follow that. And I just was like, come on. I am not a singer. I can't. You know, but, and then I was like, so I was like, I was just about to walk on stage and I was like, should I do, I was like, I should do something like where I introduce uh, Beyonce. Cause like, cause it was somebody else's special guest. It was Gabrielle Ruiz's special guest was Lin Manuel Miranda. And I was like, ladies and gentlemen, Beyonce. And they were all, the audience was just like, what? And then, and then I was like, oh, she twisted her ankle. Oh, you should put ice on that. Oh, anyway, we'll just keep doing it. So like that was my bit. But I was just like, before I walked out, I was like, just do what you normally do. Cause there's a lot of people out there. And I was like, screw it. Just go for the, go for broke. It doesn't need to be brilliant. Just have fun, do your thing. So I did that at the audition. I'm uh, not the audition, at the table read. And I just went for broke and they loved it. And I think there was half loved it and half a sigh of relief that because if I right. hadn't been able to pull it off, they would have been screwed. Yeah, yeah. And they really would have been like, well, what are we gonna do? What are we, we, there's a, gonna be a big chunk in the show that doesn't make sense because we don't have that song. And so that I pulled it off and the producers sent me notes and were like, we're so proud of you, you did a great job, which meant the world to me. Yeah. Which, and it's so funny, like, just for producers, God, that means so much. And it gives us so much more confidence. Confidence is the key. Yes. You can't fake confidence. Yes. You gotta do the work so that you can be confident, but you can't fake confidence. You, but, but a kind word here and there goes a long yes. way and gives you a lot of, yes. you know, gives you a, a, an incredible amount of support.
Pete, wow, dude. You just gave a great, great interview, dude. You, I was going to ask you for acting advice. I already heard it. You said so much. Yeah, I um, no, I but so you much. did. No, but you did, man. And I, you, dude, I, if I had a show, I would hire you as my main guy. <laughs> dude, you bring so much to the table, man. Dude, your look, look at you. Look how cool you have. You got a great look. <laughs> dude. Well, I hope somebody else feels that way. Oh, Pete, they do. Pete, we're going to end it. Anything right. else we need to know about before we press the stop button? Um, honestly, um, the only thing I, that I would also say is just that we can all be nice to each other. Amen. We could always be nice to each other. There's no, there's never a reason why you're better than anybody else, or that you feel that you feel like that somebody is less yeah. than. Okay. And make this special effort, just like I was saying, like the producer, just a little word of. A, Kindness goes a long way. Somebody that's the smallest person on your set or in whatever situation, look out for them. Yes. Be nice to them. Yes. Because it doesn't cost you anything. Yes. And I think that we need to spread that word. I think people need to believe that and do that because this feeling of like, I'm somebody and you're not is just nonsense. Well, it Pete, really is. Here you are being here you are a series regular on um, my crazy ex girlfriend. I call you up. I go, hey, Pete, will you do this? You go, yeah. I mean, you just said yes like that. Well, that's that's my improv training. Well, my improv know, training is always still, say yes. But, and it's, but, and one, that's the thing that's not to cut you off, but that's one of the things that's important about improv training is that you'll go places you never thought you would go because you said yes. yes. You'll go into discovery and that is also what the yes. work is all about. It's about discovering. It's about discover what's new. Not what, not like you're the messy roommate, I'm the clean roommate. It's like everybody can do that. It's discovery. Pete, you walk the walk, brother, which is why I wanted you on this. Well, Pete, bless you and thank you for having me. It's really thank nice, you, to, brother. nice to chat with you. Pete, do me a favor. Hmm. Tell everybody bye out there. Bye.